Welcome back to Ultra Spectacus, a journey through classic Ultraman. Well, we've seen what the cold can do to Ultra 7, but that's nothing compared to what our favorite alien slayer is about to go through. Trust me, you'll see. In episode 31, The Flower Where the Devil Dwells, we start out with some lovely nature footage. And now, Deep Thoughts by Jack Handy. I can't stand cheap people. It makes me real mad when someone says something like, Hey, when are you going to pay me that hundred dollars you owe me? Or, do you have that fifty dollars you borrowed? Man, quit being so cheap. A young girl named Cowery stops to enjoy a flower, but soon passes out. Then she begins to bleed out, badly. Kiriyama gets a call about it and tells Amagi he needs a transfusion from him. He needs to give the girl a transfusion as they're the same rare blood type. The doctor is puzzled as to what caused all this. Dan finds a strange silver flower petal on her person and recognizes it from somewhere. Kauri somehow later disappears that night and the UG scour the base for her. She's then found by a nurse who she attacks. She then knocks out Amagi and Furuhashi thinks she was after blood. Dan spots a strange bite mark on Amagi's neck and sees blood dripping from the girl's mouth. She is sucking blood, like a vampire. They then finally discover the cause of her illness. It's a microscopic bacteria called Dali. It's from outer space and can't be seen by the naked eye. It came to Earth as an egg which looks like a flower petal which Kaori accidentally was exposed to, thinking it was a real flower. Furuhashi stands watch over her, but when he turns his back on her, she disappears again. So they search for her again. She then walks around the base like that naked space girl in Life Force, only she has her clothes on. And then she incapacitates Anne and Kiriyama. She goes to where Amagi is and he wakes up too. We then cut to a carousel. As if this couldn't be any more disturbing. I guess these space bacteria just wanted to have a day at the park? I don't know. The UG show up, but by the time they do, Kauri is gone and Amagi is left behind. They eventually find her and take her down with a trank bullet. The doctors and the UG wonder what they must do to cure her of the disease. Dan only knows one way, but it's very risky. He transforms and shrinks down, entering her bloodstream. Fantastic Voyage style. He finds the Dali bacteria, which attacks him with, what else, bubbles. Maybe Bubble Man from Mega Man 2 should fight Ultra 7. He might actually win for once. Kauri, meanwhile, looks like she's trying to digest a bad night at Chipotle. Seven blasts Dali and it gets back up. It then sprays him with crazy foam. This freezes Seven, who you may remember is weak against the cold. Looks like the writing staff remember too. Seven blasts Dali again with his own bubbles, which finish it off. Wow, who knew the deadliest weapon in 60s toku was Bubbles? Screw you, Kuga's nuclear rider kick. Bubbles are the real destructive power. Well, the girl is cured and all is well. In 
In episode 32, The Strolling Planet, the TDF gets a message from Space Station V3 that another UFO is heading to Earth. What is this, the 30th time that's happened now? Well, it's coming from the asteroid belt, so they head out in Ultra Hawk to spot it. But surprise, it's a flying island, not a ship. It's massive, and it's heading right for them. It then blasts Hawk 1 out of the sky. They take Hawk 3 to find them. The UG and Hawk 1 wake up to find out that they crashed. Dan, Amagi, and Furuhashi try to discover where they landed. They try to contact the others, but a strange interference blocks the signal. They find out what they think is an alien base. So this is a strolling planet from the asteroid belt. They investigate the building, but it seems abandoned. To their surprise, the door opens. They think it's an unmanned base, and the machinery inside is what's causing the jamming signal. They inspect it to find the main machine. Before they can figure it out, they get locked inside. The same waves from that base are also knocking out communications all over the world. No one can contact anyone. And spot something, and they pull over to look, but get hit by an invisible wall. They try to fly the pointer over, but it's no good. Even the guns on the car can't penetrate this invisible force field. There's some kind of invisible barrier. Oh, so that's what an invisible barrier looks like. They spot the asteroid is moving on radar, heading right for the TDF base. Kiriyama can't call the base either, so they decide to head back there and warn the others. And, after crunching the numbers, tells them that the asteroid will hit them in less than an hour. Manabe orders a missile be fired at them. Meanwhile, in the alien base, Amagi fiddles with the controls, while they think the asteroid heading for the TDF base is a time bomb. Man, it just isn't their day, is it? Amagi gets the door open finally, and they try to get back to Hawk 1. Dan decides he will go and demolish the base with bombs to stop the asteroid, and hopefully stop the jamming signal. But, big shock, a monster appears. Dan tries to transform, but the signal is also blocking his Ultra Eye from being used. The monster called Riggs, oh, I'm sorry, Rigger, gets closer while the others open fire on it, trying to distract it. Dan calls in a new capsule monster, Agira, to fight it. The two butt heads while Dan plants the bombs and gets the hell out of Dodge. The base goes up in smoke, and Dan gets knocked out in the process. The two monsters are still slugging it out as Dan wakes up. He calls Agira back and now he can transform and fight the monster. Then he mounts it. Okay. Kiriyama goes to rescue the others off the asteroid while Manabe readies the Killy to be fired. Oh, what a cute name for a weapon of mass destruction, Killy. Seven kicks the monster down while Hawk 3 appears to save the others. They can't find Dan, so they split up to look for him. Seven uses Eye Slugger to decapitate the beast and carries it off for good measure. I don't want to think about what he's going to do with that. Kiriyama tells the Yuji to leave without Dan before the asteroid is blown to bits. You see Seven carrying the head and... Where did it go? Did he just drop it? Did he mount it on his mantle? Where did the head go? Uh, oh god, I don't want to think about it. You're a sick man, Dan. In episode 33, The Invading Dead, an aquatic vehicle containing important TDF documents is on its way to Paris. Meanwhile, back at Japan, the Ultra Guard, um, hits a pedestrian. Oh wait, he was already dead. Or were they? Seems the gang is dealing with the walking dead. Then this weird transition happens. Manabe opens the vault with his gun key. Yeah, gun key. 
Inside is the ultimate mixtape. Back to the zombie outbreak and... Gah! Stop doing that! This show's giving me motion sickness. It seems the living dead were stolen from a morgue and someone or something is controlling them. Dan is ordered to stand guard and make sure the corpses don't get up again. It's his job to make sure they stay dead. Or undead. Or re-undead. Whatever. We then see someone doing shadow puppets. Dan knows something is there and Anne is attacked. Naturally. But the bodies still haven't moved. The shadow puppeteer tries to break into the vault. Whatever it is, they want the secret documents. Dan realizes the Lord of Shadows here is using psychic powers to control the dead. When Dan thinks he found it, he transforms, but before he can do anything, he's shrunk down and put in a glass cup. Thankfully, he's still able to start a fire and alert his teammates. They find Dan now back in human form. He tells his teammates that some being with telekinesis is manipulating the dead people. They're able to find the signal and track it to a basement. They see antennas that were set up to obtain the stolen info, so you guessed it, more spaceships are coming. Dan gets in Hawk 2 and heads for space. Sure enough, they spot a ship. Thankfully, Dan got out just in time and goes for some payback as Ultra 7. Unfortunately, he gets snagged in their tractor beam. The UG shows up to provide support. They free the trapped Ultra 7 and shoot down some small ships for good measure. Together, 7 and the UG mop up the remaining ships. Later, the guys are scared by their own shadows. <laughs> Our heroes, ladies and gentlemen. In episode 34 of The Vanishing City, Dan stops while on patrol to listen to the sounds of construction. He asks the construction crew if they saw anything but are interrupted by a roaming bus. I hope this isn't the driver. They blow out a tire on the crazy bus, but then it suddenly disappears. As do cars and people. They just vanish. The next day, buildings begin to disappear, too. Big surprise, aliens are stealing things. Seems they wanted a refuge to live in, so they stole a city. The staff officers get a call from the culprit saying that they have Ultra 7 and will use him to attack. Meanwhile, Ann keeps looking for Dan and Soga. The aliens use the captured Dan and make him become Ultra 7. He then begins to attack the city by blowing up cars and smashing buildings. He throws his eye slugger at UG but misses. Kiriyama finds the alien hideout and blasts one and the console. Suddenly, this disgusting blob floods the city. Warning. We interrupt this presentation with the following urgent message regarding the stuff. If you see it in stores, call the police. If you have it in your home, don't touch it. Get out. The stuff is a product of nature, a deadly living organism. It is addictive and destructive. It can overcome your mind and take over your body and nothing can stop it. The stuff you have been warned. It turns into, what else, a giant monster. Foam Monster Duncan. No, not Duncan, Dankin. It then gets into a fight with Ultra 7, who is no longer being controlled. Looks like he's fighting a giant Brillo pad. Seven gets knocked into a building and blasts Dankin. It then turns into foam again, so I guess Ultra 7 won? I don't know. Kiriyama reunites with the others, and now the city is just stranded in the desert. Oh well, not their problem, I guess. 
The people who worked and lived in those buildings, tough luck. In episode 35, Lunar Horror, the TDS moon base is blown to smithereens. But never mind that, someone is showing off a new gizmo that makes things float. Hey, it's Kiriyama's old running buddy, Karata. He gets the message about what happened, as does Kiriyama. Naturally, it's up to them to investigate. They head to V3 to join in on the investigation. Karata and Kiriyama have some chit-chat over the intercom while heading to the scene of the crime. Suddenly, Kiriyama's chest begins to hurt, and Dan goes to get some medicine. Kiriyama decides now is a good time to have a smoke. Well, no wonder your chest hurts. Heart and lungs are probably black and tarry as La Brea right now. Kiriyama notices his lighter flame is huge and realizes there's an oxygen leak. Dan finds this odd as he just checked it. They then get some turbulence, and then suddenly the Ultra Hawk just stops. Dan reassures Kiriyama that he checked the equipment, but he doesn't believe him. Suddenly the radio signals go out. They can't call the base. Something about this screams sabotage. Who could have done this? Thankfully they use their auxiliary boosters to keep moving. The UG contact Karata to tell them that communication with the Hawk has been lost. They still head for the moon anyway to investigate. The Hawk then picks up what they think is causing the problems, but it's coming from Karata's ship. Why? Eventually both ships are able to land on the moon. Karata and Shirahama head to the destroyed base on a moon buggy to scope it out. While Karata is inspecting the remains, Shirahama tries to pull his oxygen tube. They end up fighting until Shirahama reveals he's a fake. The real one died two years ago. This faker is here for revenge on Karata and Kiriyama for trying to kill him three years ago. Before he can do the deed, Kiriyama and Dan show up. The Fiend tells Karata to act casual, and Dan immediately knows something is wrong as does Kiriyama, who is onto the face. He shoots him and reveals his alien self, Zampa. The alien then becomes this giant moon monster, Patero, and attacks them. Dan is able to slip away and become Ultra 7. We're then treated to a fight on the moon. Ew, did it just take a piss on Ultra 7? That's disgusting! Kiriyama gets back to the Ultra Hawk, and Ultra 7 begins to lose his power. The minus 180 degrees on the moon is beginning to take its toll on our hero. Remember, he can't stand the cold. Kiriyama fires a rocket that explodes nearby. The heat gives Ultra 7 a recharge. Now with his second wind, he destroys this monster. Dan makes it back to the ship and they head home. Karata follows in his ship. Anne looks up and assures herself that the boys will come home. Seriously, when do they not? In episode 36, a lethal 0.1 seconds, we see Soga competing in a shooting contest as the UG watch. Team Soga is tied with his friend slash rival, Hirota. The latter ends up winning the contest, however, and Soga beats himself up for missing such an easy shot. Hirota gloats about his victory, and Soga's still a good sport about it. Hirota then hears a voice in his head that said it helped him win. It seems Hirota made a proverbial deal with the devil to win, and the voice says it requires his special skills. Manabe later calls the UGN to tell them that a brilliant rocket scientist has been assassinated. It seems they weren't the first, however. 
Everyone who's involved in the TDF Secret Artificial Sun project has been targeted or killed. Seems the killer is also quite the marksman. Like someone Soga knows. Soga is tasked with protecting the next target, and the assassin succeeds. Soga ends up taking a bullet in the gut as well. Thankfully, he survived. Soga is down on himself as he let the professor die. Hirota is only grazed in the shootout, saying he was chasing another culprit, but they got away. Seems the dead prof was a fake, and the real one is coming to Japan tomorrow. Smart. Soga talks with Hirota about what happened. He thinks he's hiding something. Him? Nah. Hirota gives him the brush off like a jerk, but Soga then confronts him with the truth. He knows that Hirota shot him, saying it was the wound that gave him away. Because in actuality, Soga's the one that gave it to him. Hirota goes to shoot him, but Soga is quicker on the draw. He tries to call the others, but something stops him, knocking him out. Yep, it was an alien that hired Hirota. Bet you didn't see that coming. The alien Pega reveals that he's the one who's been using Hirota to kill off the scientist, using his telekinesis. He tortures Soga while the real professor lands in Japan. The Yuji and Hirota serve as bodyguards to the professor, and Soga's acting very strange and cold to his teammates. Once Hirota gets out of the city, he escapes with the professor and loses the pointer with a smoke screen. Dan wants to double back, but Soga stops him and says he is working for Pega now. He tries to take the wheel, but Amagi knocks him out. Dan uses the car's ultrasound detector to find a secret passage in the tunnel. They then try to catch up with Hirota's car. GRENADE! That stops the car dead in its tracks, knocking Dan out, but snaps Soga out of his hypnosis, somehow. He moves Dan over and takes the wheel. I keep forgetting this car can fly. He uses it to get ahead of Hirota and shoots out the tire. Hirota takes the professor as a meat shield when Soga chases him. He tries to reason with his frenemy, but Hirota isn't having it. He goes to shoot, but they both fire on each other like in a duel. Hirota goes down, and it seems Soga won. The ship lands and blasts at Soga, who takes the professor and runs. Dan wakes up, gets the loud humming of that ship did it, and he transforms. The ship unloads on Seven with a full-on salvo. Seven runs through the volley of gunfire and boards the ship. He orders Pega to return to his planet. When he refuses, he tells him again to leave. He doesn't, so they start fighting. Pega gets blasted in the scuffle and Seven leaves, blowing the ship to bits. Soga finds Dan next to Hirota's body. Oof. Hell of a thing to happen to a friend. In episode 37, The Stolen Ultra Eye, oh boy, here we go again. <sighs> Amagi, Furuhashi, and Dan are on a late patrol near a place where several UFO sightings took place. They then spy a beautiful woman driving a dump truck. Huh, must be a scab. Union strikes, you know. They find someone babbling about a light and a woman. They find where powerful jets burned up the ground nearby. Guess our lady driver's the alien of the week. You're so shocked. They call Dan to tell him to flag that truck down, and it almost runs him over, so he goes after it. A floating light from a Spencer's gifts blinds Dan, and he crashes. The woman takes his ultra eye while he's unconscious. Dan, seriously, this keeps happening! You've got to get a lockbox or something for that thing! Meanwhile, at a planetarium, the lady enjoys the show. Well, I guess she's making the most of her time on Earth. Wait a few years, lady, and they'll invent something called Laser Floyd. It's really an experience, especially if you've got edibles. Uh, so I've heard. Meanwhile, on Space Station V2, not V3, they detect a strange signal. It's the girl trying to reach the Magellan Nebula. V2 calls Kiriyama at the Earth's base. 
Dan's determined to find the girl and his ultra eye, so they track the signals the girl gives off trying to phone home. Three days pass and nothing. The fourth day, they get a lead on the girl. Amagi discovers that she's calling Planet Magellan to ask if they are coming to pick her up. Seems she needs a lift home, that's all. So this girl's basically a teenage E.T. Ah, the 60s. Free love, psychedelic rock, and if this party is any indication, lots of drugs and unsafe sex. Dan finds the girl and the party is over. She got away, though. Bummer. It seems this girl was drawn into the band's rhythm. They discover it was a coded message all along. Magellan has sent a missile to Earth. She's been betrayed. V2 confirms the missile's on its way to Earth and their weapons can't seem to stop it. And Dan can't stop it without his Ultra Eye. Kiriyama orders everyone to launch in the Hawks, but Dan can't find his Ultra Eye. So he goes AWOL. Ultra Hawk 1 launches, but when Ultra Hawk 2 doesn't launch, Kiriyama orders Anne to find Dan. Dan takes the pointer out to find the girl before it's too late. Anne offers to go in Dan's place, so they launch. Both Hawks head out to stop the missile while Dan returns to where the party was. It seems the kids are all wearing fake Ultra Eyes. Okay, that's just being cruel. And how she or they made all these fake Ultra Eyes in less than a day, it just makes my head hurt. Maybe one of her alien powers is 3D printing? Who knows? When he wakes up, he finds the girl. She then shoots him. Well, this is awkward. The Hawks blast the missile, but nothing works. They can't even dent it. Dan, somehow not dead, tries to tell the girl that her people have abandoned her, and they're planning to do her in along with the rest of the planet. He pleads with her to live on this planet, and she returns his Ultra Eye to him. He transforms, and Seven is able to redirect the missile so it doesn't hit Earth. The girl then plays a song on the jukebox, which kills her. Huh, must have been the world's first disco song and she just couldn't live in a world with that kind of music. Dan finds her and wonders why she did that. Maybe she got boogie fever and just couldn't shake it. In episode 38, The Courageous Battle, a string of missing vehicles gets the UG's attention. Dan visits a boy in the hospital who's about to go through surgery, so they go without him. The boy, named Osamu, is worried that he may die, but Dan reassures him he'll be fine. Osamu then tries to make a break for it. He doesn't get very far, though, with his heart defect. Dan again reassures the boy. Osamu asks Dan if he will be there tomorrow for his surgery, and he promises he will. Unless the world falls under major attack again, which is very unlikely. Meanwhile, the UG inspects where the cars vanished. They find a pair of giant footprints. Now this is odd. Seems 30 vehicles vanished in a thick fog. But how? Dan asks Anne to pick up the doctor tomorrow. Hey, is that Donald Pleasance? Nah, I guess it wouldn't be. Unfortunately, they hit gridlock. And the fog from before rolls in again. Anne calls the UG to tell them it's happening again. They try to clear up the fog with colored smoke and spot a giant robot. So that's what's been stealing the cars. The Hawks unload on it, but it does nothing and it keeps swiping cars. This thing doesn't even retaliate. Anne tries to blast it, but that only makes it target her and the doctor's car. Oh no! Without the doctor, Osamu is a goner! The robot then blasts one of the Hawks out of the sky with a head laser. Oh, now it retaliates. Furuhashi is out cold when the plane crashes, so Dan transforms. Seven tries to grab a car out of its pincers, but has trouble. He's able to get Anne's car free, though. Dan appears before them and tells them to get to the hospital. Quick. Osamu is now afraid and refuses to go through with it without Dan there. 
The UG get an idea to send out the fake traffic reports and send in fake cars laced with bombs to blow up the robot. Anne returns and tells Dan Usamu needs him to be there, but he has to go out and trap the robot. Boy, Dan's really in a pickle here. The UG put bombs in all the cars on the road and order the fake traffic reports to go out. And now we wait. Osamu is still throwing a fit and runs again. He still wants Dan to be there for him. The robot then takes the bait. Once it does, it leaves. The Hawks chase it and prepare to detonate the bombs. I sure hope no civilians were trapped in there. They detonate the bombs and it doesn't work. Dan is bummed that he can't be by Osamu's side as he's then wheeled into the operating room. The robot goes on a rampage downtown and the Hawks open fire on it. Again with no effect. The Hawk Dan is on gets shot down again and Dan makes a run for it. But he's hit by falling debris. Dan walks off the injury and goes to Osamu's side. Thank God he crashed right outside the hospital, am I right? The UG try to stop the robot from going towards the hospital where Osamu is. Anne tries to get Dan some medical attention, but he hears the robot coming and has to return to battle. Injured or not. He goes to the roof and transforms. Seven tries to fight this robot despite his injuries. Seven's eye slugger just bounces off of it. Can't even put a dent in it. Seven then gets the idea to become a humanoid bullet. That somehow turns the bot to scrap. This looks like a job for the human bullet! Fire me, boy! Dan is there when Osamu wakes up post-surgery. He's gonna be just fine, and Dan's wounds are tended to. All's well that ends well. In episode 39, The Seven Assassination Plan, Part 1, this episode starts with some aliens watching stock footage of Ultra Seven's past fights, listing his skills and abilities. They're forming a plan to take him out and make Earth ripe for the taking. The UG are having a day at the fair, but it seems they were pranked. Furuhashi gets a gift from his sister's friend, a good luck charm, a half of a gem, from Africa. I'm sure that this won't be important later. The team gets another report and have to check again, even if it is a prank. Dan and Ann check it out and they discover they're being watched. The aliens from before, alien Guts, reveal themselves. Dan tells Ann to get out of here, but she refuses. Guts challenges Dan, but he's not going for it. Dan chases Guts and then gets surrounded by a pack of them. Dan summons Wyndham to deal with this problem. Ann calls for help as Wyndham tries to squash the Guts. But he can't hit them as they keep disappearing. Dan calls Wyndham back, but the alien ship blasts him first. Aw, poor robot chicken. One of the guts grows giant size, and Dan thinks this could all be a trap. Thankfully, the others show up in Ultra Hawk 1 to help. Dan realizes these pranks were to lure him out and no one else. Hawk 3 spotted the ship and opens fire, but it shoots them down instead. The guts then taunt the Ultra Guard. Dan transforms and attacks with Eye Slugger, but the guts repel any and all of his signature attacks. They're obviously working to tire him out. Seven can't lay a hand on them as they keep teleporting. What a bunch of cheapskates. They're like an annoying final boss in a video game. Then they split in two and it becomes a beatdown. Seven is outnumbered and outdone as his beam lamp slash color timer begins to blink. They got him right where they want him. Ah, but they don't kill him. No. They have something far more showy and symbolic planned for him. Crucifixion. Spoiler alert, this is not going to be the last time that this happens to an Ultra in this franchise. The UG show up and they all begin to scream for Dan. They find Soga, but he doesn't know where Dan is either. Okay. I said I wasn't going to appear on this show on camera, but I'm going to make an exception just this once. Whoever just did that, 
Never do that again for the love of all things Ultra. Okay? All right. Back at it. The military attacks the gut ship and they get decimated in no time. Their weapons can't get through a powerful barrier that ship has. The Guts make the announcement that they have beaten Ultra 7. And to add insult to injury, they hang him up for display. They plan to execute him at dawn, which is in 12 hours. The UG try to think of a way to save Seven. Anne is worried about Dan's disappearance, and no one can seem to put two and two together here. Sorry to nitpick, but that just bugs me. They pick up some kind of signal, but what could it be? The episode ends with people looking at the trapped Ultra 7. セブン In episode 40, The Seven Assassination Plan Part 2, the UG discover that strange signal is not coming from space, but somewhere else. Amagi does his thing and he's able to discover where the signal is coming from. It's coming from Ultra 7 of all places. It seems he's sending them a message. He wants them to blast him with something called Magnelium Energy. The energy is derived from a rare mineral found only in Africa. But they could never get anything like that on such short notice before the deadline. Unless... Furuhashi figures it out and gives Amagi the gem. He begins to work his magic to deus ex up a little science -y machina. Unfortunately, it's not enough to crack that shell and free Ultra 7. The Guts target a friend of Furuhashi's who has the rest of the gem. Looks like they're on to their little plan. On the way back to the base, they find the girl Natsu. She says she has the other half of the gem at her house. She gives them her half and Amagi is able to make the cure and they head out in Ultra Hawk to save Seven. But the alien guts aren't going to let them near him without a fight. They aim for Seven's beam lamp with the Magnelium Energy Beam, but nothing happens. Something's wrong. The Ultra Hawk gets hit, but they're still airborne. Suddenly the big cross vanishes. It was a fake. Dawn is approaching and they have only one more chance. In the morning, the UG go out and the alien ship targets Natsu again. But they find out she's a decoy. Furuhashi attacks the saucer and it runs. He then spots the real Seven in the mountains. Also, I should point out that it's well past dawn now. The sun is out. Way out. Seven should be dead as a doornail by now. No? Eh, whatever. The UG take the magma riser just as the guts are about to execute Seven. They blast the real Seven with the energy beam, and now he bursts out of the cross prison. He's free, and he's pissed. He then sucks up the power of the sun and attacks. The guts are well and rightfully screwed as they cower in their ship. Seven sends a supercharged eye slugger and blasts their ship to bits. Why they didn't get out, grow big, and do what they did last time is beyond me. Maybe they were just too afraid? I don't know. They find Dan passed out in a field nearby. Guess they thought he was a prisoner on the ship or something? Who knows? Who cares? I'm just glad it's over.
Well, that's it for now. Check back next time when we'll see yet another giant robot, a Super 8 man with laser eyes, and the biggest invasion in history. And I'll see you in the land of light. What a man, what a man, what a man, what a man, what a mighty good man. Yes, he is. <laughs> まったく恐ろしい奴らだよ。いくらガードは完璧な機器だからって。シャドーマンまでは防げませんからね。見ろ。うん。おお。自分の影だよ。え?あ、バカ。いや、参ったな。隊長。ドン。いつの間に<笑